on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Seeing aspects of ourselves, whether it's good aspects or bad aspects, even in the villain, um, is relatable. And, you know, readers connect with that, and that's why it's so important. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show. It's James Blatch. And Mark Dawson. And we welcome you on a Friday to discuss everything that's essential in the world of the wannabe indie authors and the very successfully progressed indie authors. Yes, and first of all, Alan, who are we going to offend today? Or say, who are you going to offend today? Is uh, it going to be Australians? I'm going to generalise um, about everyone. So, uh, for those the Germans, you, the Germans. <laughs> no, I would defended the Germans in the group today. Um, yes, I've had a little bit of stick because I use some, uh, frankly sloppy language to describe uh, old people fiddling about with technology and how we should be mindful of that when we send out links to uh, free books etc um i stand by the general gist of it but i perhaps could have chosen my words more carefully uh, so i think i referred to people in their 60s i mean i'm seven and a half years off being in this my 60s now but honestly when i was criticizing old people i thought well they won't hear it will they because you know unless they've got one of, <laughs> oh god here we go unless they got one of those trumpets uh, to oh listen dear. To. Um, <laughs> that's it double down compound your error so yes yeah, so somebody got very upset about it but uh yeah there you go i mean I, I stand by the basic thing is we should make it as easy as possible for people to uh get our books and that's why we were talking about book funnel specifically at that point which we thoroughly recommend as a service and yeah frankly i look after my parents-in-law my father a few other people who are uh, don't find technology as easy as younger people do now that as a generalism but in general let that me is true. let me dig you out of the hole you're scrambling to dig yourself out of so it basically oh, no the, the gist is we need to make it as easy as possible for everyone it doesn't matter if they are 25 um yeah, or 65 so inclusive <laughs> see before we lose all of our subscribers because james has annoyed them all um i'm going to be the uh the, the calm and rational voice of reason in today's podcast James is going to be Alan Partridge. We could be like a um, on that bombshell. A talk, a talk radio uh, where you know two sides of the. I could be the mad conspiracy theorist, and you could be the calm voice of reason. Well, let's not change our usual roles. Um, <laughs> let's that's go with that's that. kind of how it is. Uh, anyway, uh, this highly professional podcast, which is uh, very sensitive to everybody in all sections of the community. If you'd like to support us uh, in our endeavors, oh, yeah, that's, not that's, to, this is going to work. Not to offend people. Um, we love to have your support. So thank you so much indeed if you've been to patreon.com forward slash self publishing show. And I want to give a special shout out and welcome to our newest subscribers this week. That's Doreen Stridham. And Doreen lives in Cavan in Ireland. Uh, welcome, Doreen. And Dominic, and I'm not 100% on this surname at all. It's sort of spelt Saucedo, Dominic Saucedo, but it might be Saucedo, maybe. Uh, he lives in Minneapolis. Susu Studio? Susu Studio. Oh, Phil Collins reference. How old are you? Old uh, enough. There we go again. Um, <laughs> if you need any help with your tech, let me know. Uh, and Dominic, <laughs> thank you very much from Minneapolis, Minnesota, over there in Prince Country. Thank you indeed. Uh, and you can join Dominic and Doreen and get your own shout out on the self-publishing show if you go to patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast. And another thing to mention, Mark, is where we are speaking at the moment. We are in the middle of an open period for people to enroll into self-publishing 101. We are, yes. We opened, as we record this on Friday, the what the 8th of March. We opened on Wednesday. And as usual, I have absolutely no idea how well these things are going to go. And um, we were delighted. It's been really, really busy. So we've had several hundred authors have signed up and are currently um, going through the, the content. Had some really lovely messages from other, other groups. So um, Craig Martel posted into the 20 Books group um, and then loads and loads of students um, kind of fed back their experience with the course into that group. Adam Croft posted into his Facebook group this morning. Um, lots of people are, are spreading the word. And in our own community, we had someone asked um, for advice as to whether the course was right for them. And I very deliberately stepped back um, and let um, other people answer because, you know, it's not always going to be right for everybody. And... Uh, 
that person had 20 or 25 people um, feeding back with why, I think generally why they thought it was a good idea to, to sign up. So um, it's really lovely to see that. And, you know, I, that's one of, I, I, that's a, a course I'm very fond of as a kind of a foundation course to help people get started. And it's, you know, it's almost certain that some of those people who signed up this week in, in a year's time might be like Jason Dalgleish and are looking back on uh, six figures in their first 10 months, who knows? So, you know, um, certainly fingers crossed that we get a few people like that. Yeah, and the really exciting thing is that I get a discount code because I can start doing it soon. No, you're paying full price. Oh, you're so mean. <laughs> That's ageist because I'm in my 50s. Um, <laughs> yes, now, uh, one thing you haven't said is where to go if you want to learn more about the one on course. We didn't give course. me a chance. <laughs> that is self-publishing. You insulted me before I got the chance to say the URL. I'll do it. It's, uh, it's selfpublishingforward.com forward slash 101, 101. That will take you to the sales page where there's um, lots of information, testimonials, there's a walkthrough video, um, and uh, details on the bonuses and the course curriculum. Everything you need is there. There's also a chat box. You can um, hit live chat and you'll get one of us. If you if you get James, sorry about that. Don't be old, please. Um, it will be it will be an unpleasant experience for you. Um, but you might get John. John is lovely and will um, we'll make you feel yes, he'll make you feel warm and fluffy and cultured. Um, and it's completely age blind, um, uh, whereas James, of course, is not. Yes, I'll, I'll dismiss you straight. <laughs> straight. I'll ask your age as soon as you come on. And I'm afraid if you're in your 60s, you're out. And that's as simple <laughs> as that. It's just no point. Um, I tell you what, the chat thing is fun. I was thinking about this yesterday morning. It was breakfast time. Uh, I think I, I had a dental appointment, so I had to get out of the house quite quickly. And I had a quite complicated uh, chat. I was in the middle of this guy who was in the States. His credit card, for whatever reason, just wasn't working and we couldn't really fathom out. We were going through all the processes. And I was thinking how brilliant it is that we, the way businesses run today, you know, you start up, you're with your friends, you start up this business. And before you know it, you find yourself in a call center, you know, like you're working in a call center, doing live chat, helping people do things online, etc. And it was unthinkable a few years ago. Everyone was compartmentalized um, but today we can start our own businesses and run them like really good professional businesses which ours is well in, um, in theory that's what we can do we, we could can do. do we are doing that um and uh, i love it i love the variety of it i love being on the end of a chat and people are sometimes surprised and they say oh my goodness it's you from the podcast but it's brilliant uh yeah i get this i haven't done any live chats this time but a couple of times last time for ads i they realized it was me and they were one one person was kind of fanboying a bit, which was I still find that absolutely ridiculous. But anyway, it's very very flattering. I bet people don't believe it's you. I say, is this really? Mark it's Wilson? John Dyer pretending to be me. Yeah, again, he does that with your credit card. Yeah, I think you've got about a week left or so to sign up for the one on one course, and um, we are doing a webinar. Are we not? We're doing a webinar on how to get reviews, which is a bit of a chicken and egg situation, isn't it, for authors starting out? Um, and it's also a bit of a minefield because there's strict rules about what you can and can't do so you've devised a comprehensive webinar so an hour and a half or so live with you and me um to to give some top tips and strategies on how to get your first reviews it is it's a tricky situation getting reviews it is it is as you say a chicken and egg question because um i remember when i started i wasn't selling any books so i couldn't get any reviews but i thought i needed the reviews to sell the books um and it was one of those things I couldn't qu quite wrap my head around, but um, I've kind of nailed it now. Um, I, I, I don't have a problem with getting reviews, um, good and bad. I, I get plenty of either. Um, and the webinar will look at, um, I think it's about 10 strategies that will you, you will leave with um, the means to get reviews for your books uh, as, a, as a starting author with, with perhaps minimal sales behind you. I will show you how to, to start, start the ball rolling on that. Okay, and if uh, the webinar course is completely free of charge, if you'd like to attend the webinar live, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash book reviews, or one word, book reviews, uh, you can register. And the webinar is on Monday, the 18th, 18th of March at nine o'clock UK time. So I know we're kind of straddling a time zone shift in the US um, at the moment. So I have absolutely no idea what time it will be wherever you are in the world, but we'll put that on, it'll be on the website, you can work it out. Yeah, and once you've signed up, you'll get the time in your locality, I think, we emailed to you. Um, and we should say that last time we did a similar webinar, it was oversubscribed and people were turned away. So get there early to guarantee not, your place. That's not marketing BS either. You'll see some no. people say, oh, yes, places are strictly limited. Well, places are limited. We had, I think we've got 500 maximum on our webinars. And we had, I think we probably could have done that twice last time. It was 
it was really surprising. Um, we may look at increasing the the capacity if if we, if that happens again. But to be sure that you're going to get in, um, you just, talk to yeah, the C- sign up CFO soon. before you increase that subscription. It's expensive. Yes, it is expensive. Um, but yes, get there early, and uh, we look forward to it. It'll be like the podcast live, the self publishing show live. Um, oh, yeah. Now, we also have uh, the SPF University. Um, how do you become a member of the SPF University, Mark? What are the entry qualifications? Um, well, if you are a member of any of the courses, so anyone who signed up for um, the one-on-one course will be um, will be able to get the uh, these monthly webinars that we do. Um, try to do them monthly if, if, when we can. Um, same goes for ads for author students. They, they'll get invited as well. And also, if you're a Patreon subscriber, you'll also get an invitation. Um, and... We've got a good one um, on the Wednesday, the 20th, I think, yes. with Alex Newton um, from Kalytics. And you can tell him, I don't think he uh, he quite grasped your really dreadful joke about um, ducks in the last in the last podcast, but I, just, I actually just listened to it as it went out live this morning. And for those who haven't listened to it yet, um, Alex makes a, a witty and erudite comment about um, small niches um, on Amazon. And the example he uses is, uh, there is a niche plan for people who make wooden decoys for duck hunting. And James, um, <laughs> who is not witty or erudite, um, uh, quipped that um, you'd have to be quackers to, uh, uh, to to write a book in that niche. And I don't know. I think Alex, actually, he probably did get it. He was just much too polite. Just ignored to him. up on a really terrible joke. So. The, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and someone was rude about the Germans and their sense of humour. And uh, I've had a beer with Alex, and I can tell you he's got a fantastic sense of humour. He's a lovely guy. And I think he was just being, just rolling his he eyes. Being and nice. thought, I'm just going to leave that, leave that hang in there. Okay, <laughs> that's on March the 20th. So that webinar is for members of the SPF University. They will get uh, an email out telling them how to sign up and how to get to it. And it gets parked in the courses area once you're online. So if you, it's just one of the bonuses of uh, being a member of the 101 course and the uh, Facebook groups, etc. Okay, um, Mark, now we are going to talk about Tommy Donverband, who we have uh, spoken about before. Now we follow Tommy's uh, fight against cancer. Tommy is the, the brilliant writer of uh, great children's books. My son is now chomping through Scream Street, I think is the, uh, the series. Uh, and Tommy was dealt uh, just the worst possible news very recently after fighting uh, his cancer of the throat for so long that he's been served notice now um, that it's incurable. Now, he's coming to terms with that, and he's been very brutally honest in his blog, which is a wonderful and inspiring thing to read, and our hearts go out to Tommy. This is a desperate time for his family, uh, of course, and we're doing what we can. So there's been a just giving page, a fundraising page for him. But we've got an idea to uh, raise a little bit more money for Tommy's family at this uh, this most desperate time for them. We do, yeah. So Tommy's friend, uh, Tommy, I think one of Tommy's best friends is another writer called Barry Hutchinson who uh, lives in Scotland. And I think I may be meeting Barry next week. Um, probably met him at 20 Books London as well, but he, I think he's going to LBF. Um, and he... Uh, made me aware of an auction that's been set up for Tommy whereby people are giving away things um, that uh, in exchange for, you know, people who you know, bid, bid the highest will get those things. And I think he's got things like something from Paul McCartney is in there. Some writers were involved. Tommy, um, some Doctor Who stuff. Tommy's written for Doctor Who before. So lots of cool stuff. And it got me thinking, um, what could we give away? And the, the thing I've, the thing I've um, thinking about is, is the book lab so book lab is is for patron subscribers um and if you if you don't know you i mean they're one of the most popular podcasts that we do so we'll take someone's book and we'll look at the cover the blurb uh, the sales page and the, the writing and the look inside and we'll offer constructive criticism on how all of those elements can be improved and that's with some really it's some real industry experts so stuart Bache, um brian cohen um, Jenny Nash and, and I'll chip in occasionally as well. So it's quite a it's quite a valuable um, thing to have. It would cost quite a lot of money to have those things done. Um, and so I thought, well, why don't we open it for this time only? We'll open it up more widely to the uh, to the whole SPF community and and the community beyond that. So it's a valuable prize, um, and we're going to auction that off. I think also we don't normally include a, a new cover. You you would always get a new blurb that you could test with uh, that Brian Cohen puts together. But I think this time we'll also throw in a new cover. So either Stuart will cover that or, or we'll pay for that. So you'll get a new cover for your book as well that you can you can start to work with. Um, and I may actually take whatever we get in the auction and, and double that. So I, I might do that as well. So we, we, we 
it's a really good it's a good reason to um to to help out someone who needs a bit of help and it's also a very valuable prize as well in terms of your career so um what what was what were URL we going to use for so we're going to if we if we give people this URL selfpublishingformula.com forward slash Tommy and then we'll set up a redirect to go to the actual auction site from there so um, yeah selfpublishingformula.com forward slash Tommy um, and your chance to bid on that so that's open to everybody not just Patreon supporters to bid on the the chance to be the recipient of uh, three fantastic critiques of your book your cover. Um, and uh, your yeah your your blurb and your 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 book, um, and then as Mark says, you'll also get a new cover out of it. Yeah, so I mean we should probably start the bidding at about five hundred quid. I would have thought, but let's let's see where we go. That's um that seems reasonable to me. But um yeah, let's let's all. I mean it would be great to to give Tommy and his family a, a little bit more to to help them through a very very difficult time. So um, let's all get stuck in. Good. Now, we are going to get to our podcast interview today. Our, our featured interview today is all about creating the perfect villain. And we talk about heroes as well, actually. And there's a fantastic uh, handout to, to go with this episode, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But we've got one more subject to cover before we get to our interviewee. And that is, uh, we talked about um, Germans earlier. We're now talking about uh, Germans reading your books, Mark. Oh God, yeah. Um, I think we'll, we'll, let's, we'll, we'll cover this another time, I think. we Just for a quick... Um... A snippet of what we might cover in the future i mean I, i've i've had a couple i've had three books translated into german and um i posted into the spf community um the um, slightly um sobering um uh, slightly sobering screen grab of those books with with telephone number ranks which is not something that i I've, I've had to worry about for a few years but those books even in a smaller german market compared to the uk and the us have just plunged into the into you know twenty thousand. 25,000 range with with no promotion that was they were just put up there there was no promotion no mailing list none of the things that I normally do um, affected that at all um, and so that that was a good demonstration of what happens if you don't promote your books even with with me with you know reasonably well-known name and, and a series that could be a TV show next year those books just sank without trace um, over the last couple of weeks Things have changed, and we we can look at that in perhaps in a bit more detail later. But they're now, you know, they're making fifty or sixty euros a day now, um, and you know, ticking up. And I've you know, I'm in the black to the so I'm in the red to the tune of about sixteen or seventeen thousand euros. So I've got a long way to go before I'm, I'm starting to make profit on those books, but they're moving in the right direction. Okay, well, I think that might be a dedicated episode on translation. We can try and perhaps dig out an interviewee as well. Yes. But I'd like yeah, yeah. to know how you got to that spend level. Um, broken down a little bit to understand that so mm -hmm. yeah uh, yeah let's do that let's do that in the near future okay right we are now moving on to the featured interview and it is with Sasha Black this week and I'm particularly I mean this is an SPF moment because uh, Sasha first came to our attention when she bought into the 101 course I think maybe the second release of the 101 course and she came down to London um, to talk to us about that and she was starting out, we could tell straight away this is somebody immersed in her genre, a very enthusiastic writer and very dedicated to it. She was working, working, I think, in local government at the time and wanted, obviously, to make the transition to being a full-time writer. And she was, uh, she's was, she been a very keen and, and supporter of, of you, Mark, and of the 101 course. So uh, I checked with her at the beginning of this interview, which was recorded a month or so ago, and she said she still hadn't quite made the transition. She'd cut her hours down. But she's announced this week, uh, appositely, that she has actually quit her job and is now a full-time writer. So congratulations, Sasha. Um, and she emailed me uh, this week just to say again about your course. So I'm just going to blow our own trumpet and your trumpet a little bit. And just to quote Sasha. You can blow my trumpet anytime, James. Yeah, <laughs> just to quote Sasha um, uh, from her email this week on her move to being a full-time writer. She said, there are a million author courses out there, but none help to fulfill as many author dreams as Mark Dawson's. If you want to know how credible a course really is, look at the quality of the alumni. I took Mark's course and it was instrumental in helping shape my business mindset. And now I'm joining the alumni who have made it to full-time writing. Thank you very much indeed, Sasha. Um, she has become uh, an expert in this area. She's very keen that villains and heroes are rounded, credible, 
flawed characters and not one dimensional because that's what makes your book a better book and stands out makes the reader want to turn the page and she's become uh, a little bit of a guru in this area so she teaches on this she writes on this and it's a great interview on this subject and it comes with a brilliant I think 17 odd pages worth of instruction and tips on how to create and craft your perfect villain you can get the pdf if you go to self-publishing show forward slash villains self-publishing show forward slash villains do they spell villains the same in the us as we do with an ai in the middle of it i think so there's only yes. one way to spell villains <laughs> do, yes. yeah yeah um and uh yeah that's really really worth having so uh, i'd recommend that you go and get that right with no more further ado, it's been a mammoth introduction, but we're here at the meat of the self-publishing shows episode this week. Let's talk to Sasha Black. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Sasha Black, welcome to uh, the self-publishing show. I hope the edit will come in just as I say Sasha Black and not when you said I'm so nervous I'm going to vomit on the mic a fraction before then. <laughs> I really hope so too, but thanks for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> we share everything on the self-publishing show. Look, um, it's brilliant to have you on. We've known each other a couple of years now, haven't we? Because you... We have. We have, yeah. Popped we in... met at the London Book Fair, I think, a couple of years ago. Yes. So. And uh, and people might remember that we got drunk and you made me shake your hand and promise my book was going to be out by this London Book Fair. I did. And I will not let you forget. <laughs> What's at stake? I can't remember. Did we say what was at stake? Is it the beer? Honestly, it's it's probably beer and gin. So, yes. you know, I don't think the stakes are too high I here, know. but still, public pressure. <laughs> public pressure. That's what we need. Okay. Well, look, you're here. Um, we should say that you have, in the time that I have known you, you've gone from wannabe author to published author. And are you living off your writing? Not quite, now? but okay. um, I have started to reduce my hours at um, the sort of corporate rat race. Um, and again, I'll be reducing more hours in April. So it is coming down quite rapidly now, uh, but not quite full time. OK, well, that's uh, definitely on the horizon for you, which has been uh, which is very exciting. We shall celebrate that moment, regardless oh, of my own. There will part. be a huge party, yes. <laughs> which is great. And uh, you've become very interested in uh, a specialist area, which is the layered complexities of a character, not, you know, not the one dimensional character, but how you create a, a compelling character both the hero and the villain you've written two books on this subject one dedicated to each of those so I've blogged for a really long time and I kind of started blogging just to record my own journey and I wanted somewhere to write down the lessons that I was learning because I'm really um, obsessed with words and learning and development and I just wanted somewhere to put them down and I started sharing them and I wrote I think a f sort of five posts about villains. Some of them were quite ranty, um, sort of, you know, about cliches and how there weren't many female villains. And they went not viral, but I had, you know, tens of thousands of views in a very short amount of time. Uh, and so I kind of decided there was probably a market there. I did some research on Amazon, had a look to see what craft books there were. There wasn't one particularly on villains, or there was sort of one or two, but not many. Um, and it just spiraled from there, really. And I just compiled the lessons. You can't really turn blogs into a book. There's, you know, it's a very different structure. Um, but it sort of bloomed from there. And once I'd finished Villains, it felt very natural then to go on to do one on Heroes. Okay. Well, look, should we start with Villains? Everyone loves a baddie, right? Absolutely. Now, how, how do we approach this? Because everybody has probably a fairly simplistic idea in their mind about their baddie and the bad things they're going to do. But good novels have more complicated characters than that, don't they? Absolutely. I think one of the one of the most difficult parts about writing a villain is the lack of page time. You know, your the majority of your book, unless it's written from multiple uh, points of view, it is from the hero's point of view. So, you know, you've got 100,000 words and probably only 10 or 15,000 of those where the villain may or may not show up. And, you know, if you're writing a mystery, then actually the villain quite often doesn't appear until right at the end. So, one of the that's one of the hardest parts of creating a villain. The the other hard part is that is kind of as writers we are obsessed with our heroes. Um, you know that's that's who we're writing through the eyes eyes of. We fall in love with them. It's who we want to be. Exactly. Yeah, well, it is really. Let's be honest. We all want magical powers. Is that just me? <laughs> um, and um, so. 
yeah, so, you know, we, we don't spend much time on them. Things that we typically don't do, we don't give them a proper motivation. Um, we, we don't give them a redeeming quality. So that is, you know, a classic mistake, a villain with no likable trait. Even villains like Lord Voldemort, they have Nagini, which is a pet snake, and he's sort of, you know, nice to his pet snake. So not giving a villain a redeeming quality, that's a classic error. Using cliches that, you know, typical traps that we fall into. So yeah, very, very hard to create a good villain. But if you do, I personally think it's one of the things that hooks a reader and kind of gives gives the reader the, um, can't think of the word, you know, that kind of urge to, to turn the page because they're the source of conflict. Yeah, and we had a little chat about my writing uh, before uh, we started recording. And one of the things I'm discovering, because I'm working closely with Nedis, is whenever I have a, a character, let's say he's, he's the villain in my case, uh, and he does something nice, uh, or he's conflicted about about whether he should do something. She loves it. As mm-hmm. an editor, she said, "This is this is the conflict makes the character come alive." And of course, that's not not intuitive, particularly to first time novelists. You want to make your you want your baddie to be bad, and it's quite counterintuitive to have them portraying them in a sympathetic light, struggling with the reality of what they've got to do. But of course, that makes them an, a human and an interesting it, character. Absolutely. It does make them human. And I think that's what uh, readers connect with, because I think literature as a whole is is often a reflection of humanity. And, you know, even back in the sort of caveman days, they were telling stories. That's how we kind of, in, you know, inherited our knowledge. And we learn from it. We reflect on ourselves on it. And seeing aspects of ourselves whether it's good aspects or bad aspects even in the villain um is relatable and you know readers connect with that and that's why it's so important yeah so if you do write your villain as a sociopathic serial killer without any other attributes the only person that's going to connect with is another sociopathic serial killer and there's a limited number of those i think buying books today you say that but look at dexter look at have you seen the tv series yes, dexter I have, yeah. So for people who haven't, Dexter is um, a psychopath, but he has morals. And this is where you can layer complexity into a villain. So he works for the um, Miami, I think it's Miami Police Department, and he's a blood spatter analyst. And um, he kills people that the police fail to apprehend. Now, your moral judgment there, you would think that that would be a bad thing because he's killing people. But the way that the, um, I think it's, Jeff Lindsay or Lindsay, somebody like that, uh, the author um, plays it is is kind of as a philosophical question. Where is your your moral line? And Dexter is killing only people that adhere to a particular code um, of you know the bad things that he's done, and and that makes him relatable because he he adheres to his values. That his moral code is his values. He will he wouldn't kill a woman. He wouldn't kill a child. Um, and so even there, even somebody who's a psychopath can still have that connecting kind of inner value that, of goodness. I'm, you know. Yes. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I completely see that. And Dex is also a nice guy, which makes that uh, interesting uh, watching. I do remember at the BBFC when Mark and I and John met, we watched lots of episodes of Dexter classifying them for DVD in the UK. And then they did some work on the building and then the lift was um, a very oak panel, beautiful lift. And they covered it in all this plastic sheeting to protect it. And we stood in the lift and someone said to me, I think we're in Dexter's killing room. Yes. And we were <laughs> going because he has this killing area because he knows how about blood spatter and how to deal with it. It's a good series. Absolutely. Uh, and as you said that, you mentioned that the TV episodes, TV films and TV are great uh, examples of characters to talk about. My editor often says, watch this film and talk rather than read this book because you can do it more quickly and discuss the characters. Mm-hmm. But um, the one that always comes to mind when you talk about villains, for me, is Breaking Bad, where there are some pretty straightforward villains in there. But the main character in Breaking Bad, I think even after all the episodes, it's quite difficult to say he's ultimately the baddie or ultimately the hero. And that that complexity was compelling and gripping. I mean, maybe towards the end, I don't want to give it away for people. You can well, take I think a side. He's an anti- I think he's an anti-hero. So there are, that's another, it's kind of a hybrid. So anti-heroes um, have all of the traits of a bad guy. So they might be arrogant. They might kill people for their own benefit. They might steal. But they also have um, 
inner qualities that are good and they tend to make they tend to save the day deadpool is a great example of an anti-hero um also beetlejuice that uh, classic um Mm. character so in the end they save the day they are a hero but they return to their typical bad behaviors so their their character arc is flat in in the sense that they you know a hero will overcome his flaw the anti-hero is kind of defined by his flaw and he doesn't get better he just makes different decisions and i think walter white it's walter white it is walter white yeah yeah and i think he's probably an anti-hero yes like alan partridge it's also an (laughs) anti-hero great comedy character in the uk we mention every podcast episode um, are there certain genres that do heroes better than others? I'm thinking if you're writing a literary fiction book, which always sounds a bit snobbish and highfalutin, but if you're writing a literary fiction book, you are probably going to think about this stuff a lot more than if you're writing maybe a fantasy YA novel and you've got your arc of story of, of magic. And maybe there, when you're... Ter- and, and Mark's genre as well, these thrillers where there's a story-led type thing. Maybe these are the books where people need to take a step back and st- start adding in. Do you find there the, the, the genre novels are the ones where people aren't working as hard at layering their characters no not necessarily i think it's um i think literary fiction is well well you know and i don't i don't necessarily read an awful lot of literary fiction but to me it's more about the message and the language and the kind of portrayal that you're doing with genre fiction i i actually think they are quite character driven um but you could find different types of character arcs. So typically you have three, you have a positive character arc where a hero will start out flawed and then by the end of the novel, they will uh, be not flawed. <laughs> They'll have overcome it through all, fighting through all the obstacles in your plot. Um, you have a flat character arc, which is um, where your cat, your main character doesn't change at all. So quite often you see that in detective novels, um, thrillers possibly, Katniss from The Hunger Games has a flat character arc. She's very good, sacrifices herself throughout. Um, And then you have a negative arc where you'll have a character who starts out good, gets led down a dark path and ends up in not so good of a place. So, um, I, and I think actually it depends on the type of series that, you know, like I said, thrillers, mystery detectives, you'll often see flat characters, but the change that you'll see in the story because story is changed and so you have to have a change whether it be the character arc or something else the change typically um with the characters where there's a flat arc is usually in the world so the hero will be affecting that change on the world so katniss um in the hunger games basically takes down the the kind of bad society the capital um i spoiled it pardon you spoiled it does she take it down in the end (laughs) i thought i thought the the capital one anyway go on (laughs) Well, I would like to watch one where a villain wins, but no. Uh, yeah, so she she wins and, you know, she affects change on the world as opposed to her changing as a person. Okay. And what, so the, if you're going to have this, this character art, which will involve conflict, right? Because you can't, if you're flat, then maybe you're not conflicted. You're the one who always says, this is how we're going to do it. But... Darth Vader, I guess, is a good example of a baddie, although it happens quite late to him, does go through a transformation, right? Although that happens quite late in the story. So Darth Vader is an example. Maybe if you were to write that type of film but make it better, it's a really um, arrogant thing to say about the biggest selling franchise in the world ever that I adore. But if you were going to critique that, you might say, well, why don't you introduce some of that conflict in Vader a lot earlier on in the story? Because you'd presumably want this to help drive the story this change in the character not to suddenly at the end say oh you're right i could have been good all along absolutely and and that's one of the key things is so in um my latest book about heroes i talk about the web of connectivity um and that's how every aspect of your novel needs to be connected so there's a there's a so i studied psychology at university and there's a there's a principle called the gestalt principle which is this kind of a coined phrase the the whole is more than the sum of its parts and that to me is what a book is and the hero is kind of at the core of that web um so uh the theme um the obstacles the wound which i'll just elaborate on in a second all of these things need to be introduced sort of early-ish on and they they kind of flow together to 
within a kind of a golden thread that comes together in the climax and the kind of resolution of the story. But um, you said, you know, do you, I think the question was, do you um, ha- have to introduce them early on? Is that the question? Yeah. It's, so you yeah. can't basically have somebody who just at the end says, oh, I've redeemed myself on the last page. This, it's much right. more interesting and better for the story if, this is, if the story is, is driven by their change. Absolutely. So, so for example, um, the vil- even the villain, actually, the hero and the villain should have something in their past, so prior to the novel, that creates a kind of flaw in them, whether it be, um, you know, something happened to a detective and they're a drinker now, or, um, you know, Katniss... I can't remember actually if this is true, but a character, a hero lost a parent and therefore they're overly protective of their sibling, you know, and Katniss is protective of her sibling and that's why she sacrifices. So whatever, all the, all of these aspects, um, have to, have to be connected and the wound, particularly in, in the hero's past and even the villain's past needs to be driving their behavior in the current and each of your plot obstacles needs to test that flaw. And that's how you get to the resolution at the end, that kind of big climax. Clever. Does that make so sense? It chi- yes, it does make sense. That chips away at their floor and, and moves them Absolutely. Okay. I like that. I should be making notes. Um, <laughs> okay, well, should we talk a little bit more about heroes? We talked about villains quite a lot. You've mentioned your hero book as well. It's interesting to me that you did them separately as well. Are there significant differences? Because some of it's got to be an overlap. There are some overlaps. You know, classic things. Things like traits, motivations, both both heroes and villains need those. Um, there's probably two major differences. In the villains book, I have an entire chapter on uh, mental health because villains are quite often stigmatized um, and characterized as having a mental health. So you often have psychopaths, sociopaths, you often have female villains as being characterized with borderline personality disorder. And um, obviously having a background in psychology, it's quite important to me that, you know, it's fine if a writer wants to characterize a villain as having these disorders, but not taking into consideration um, kind of the impact in doing the research properly, you can you can end up stigmatizing a kind of sector of society. So I made a point, I worked uh, with some of my um, friends who are now clinical psychologists. I works instead of being a psychologist, but I still have friends. Um, you know, so I, I had all of my chapters kind of thoroughly checked. But, you know, I, I work to destigmatize that, you know, to put, you know, the true symptoms and um so yeah, that's one of the key things that's in the villain's book that isn't in the hero's book. And the key thing that's in the hero's book that's perhaps not in the villain's book is the hero lens. So your book, when you when you write your story, it's told through the eyes of your hero. So the hero lens is basically the funnel through which your story is told and through which your reader experiences your story. Now, typically writers worry about traits and motivations but every human on the planet has traits and everybody has a motivation that's not what's unique about your hero what's unique about your hero is how they react to their motivations how they embody their traits so let me ask you a question is turquoise more blue or more green blue <laughs> okay but I bet you half of the listeners said I've no great. idea. Yeah, it's really no, interesting. No. Yeah. But that's uh, but that's the point. Okay. How how you see turquoise and how I see turquoise is slightly different. And it's um that's what you have to capture with your hero. That's what's unique. So you will have um some here so uh, Thor and Loki in the Marvel movies have the same motivation. They both want the crown. Um, of Asgard, um, but they react to that challenge differently. And so, um, you know, Loki ends up going down this kind of dark anti-hero villainous path, whereas Thor um, embodies uh, being a leader and sacrificing. Um, and so the way that he will kind of sense and, and feel and, uh, you know, smell things will smell differently to the way that Loki does it. And so that is ensuring that you imbue your descriptions in your story with those um, nuances is how you create a unique hero. So that's one of the chapters. Yeah, it's quite a lot to think about, isn't there, to get this right? Yeah, sorry. I'm not sure I've explained that very well. But yes, there is a lot to think about. 
Yeah. And so people come up with their stories in different ways. And very often it is not the character in their minds at the beginning. Well, I don't know if this is very, but it's certainly true for me. I think of stories, so which is a, a problem for me, because I think of something that happens, something that triggers something else and, and where it's going to end up. And then after that, I start to think about the character journey. But actually, probably a good way of doing this is to think about this character, think about their flaws. And then what series of events would prod, would prod that flaw, would push that wound, and would make that character change? And that's a really brilliant way of coming up with original stories, I think. I think I've just invented Absolutely. this. <clears throat> Absolutely. And villains, typically, they'll have like a complex. So it might be um, that they have an inferiority complex. And, and that in their past will be developed by repeated exposure to failure, for example, or, um, you know, people who are in the senior um, position to them, uh, making them feel... Um, you know, uh, <laughs> inferior, yeah. it's an inferiority complex, but you know, um, it's, it's, you know, and, but that's important. It's kind of the sustained exposure to these things. So it's this, this hero, it's this, the sustained exposure to obstacles that test their floor and make them realize that they, they want to overcome it more and more and more. And obviously having something taken away or a sacrifice, you know, that, that, cause that's what readers connect with is the, the sacrifice that heroes make, not being brave. Okay. Just explain that. So, so <clears throat> lots of writers think that your hero needs to be brave and often they are brave, but that anybody can be brave. Sacrificing something, usually the, the part of themselves that's flawed. So they have to give up something, whether it be a fear and an internal fear or whether it be, um, you know, um, a crown in order to save, um, his people instead of being king um it's 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 the sacrificing of something that makes uh readers feel empathy and connect with um the hero rather mm. than them just doing an act of bravery mm, like it it's that moment in serrano de Bergerac, my favorite lines in novels where he um he ha basically agrees to set the girl up and then she talks about his sword fighting, says, you've been, been very brave. He says, I've been braver since. And she doesn't know ah. what he's talking about, but he's obviously realized his place in the world is not going to be with her. Sacrifice. Yeah. And that, that stands, you know, I remember that from years ago, that stands out with you from the character's point of view. So that, that does make sense. And I'm thinking through as you're talking about heroes and villains. I think heroes probably, there are more villains you can easily name. Um, and we can talk about serial killers or Jeffrey Dahmer and ultimately Hitler, I guess most people would say is the ultimate villain. Um, heroes, I think, are slightly more complex in my mind because most heroes you'll name someone, you know, Nelson Mandela in his day was controversial. Not many people would probably say controversial things about him today, but he's had that complex life. Whereas not many people you're going to meet are going to say Hitler's misunderstood. So we do probably see villains one dimensionally, but the way you're talking about it, even Adolf Hitler was a little boy at some point and something happened, things, a series of things happened to him along the way to end up as this monster by the 1940s. And, and I guess the more we understand about that, the better writers we're going to be about real characters. Absolutely. And there's that really famous cheesy phrase that even villains have mummies, but I do kind of love it because it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it is true, isn't it? Um, but heroes, it's funny, just thinking that through out loud, that the, the heroes we can mention, trying to think of some other, who are who are our heroes today, Sasha? Who are our heroes? Who's your hero? Oh, my goodness. I had a, I feared you were going to ask me that. Um, well, like literary hero or kind of superhero? I mean, I love I love Batman. I love anti-heroes. I'm terrible mm. for, you know, I I don't really like the, 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 the knight in shining armor, speckled, you know, gloriously rippling torsos i much prefer the kind of more uh, real reflect that that's why i like anti-heroes because they are a reflection of humanity they are they get to do all of the things that we secretly want to do and can't actually do um so yeah you know your dead calls are, are and um beetlejuice yeah they're, they're they're my kind of heroes and who are your and who are your villains well, similarly, the, you know, they are half and half. But um, with villains, I suppose I, 
I don't think I have a favorite, but I like different aspects of different villains. So, for example, in The Matrix, I really like Agent Smith's monologue. Um, he has this quite famous monologue where he talks about humanity and how we're like a virus um, upon the earth. And it's kind of true. Mm. And I think that's one, if you can, if you as a writer can get the audience to agree with your villains crazy, as I like to call it, you know, yeah. their kind of world domination plans, even for a second, you, you've smashed it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you can do that by, um, um, <clears throat> have, letting them have integrity so uh getting them to do stick to what they say they're going to do no matter what having letting them have a value because lots of people only give their heroes values but actually villains need values as well so kind of morals um things that they value whether it be loyalty or or um justice and then you know pervert that sense of justice um and and un, unyielding logic because that's what makes Agent Smith's monologue brilliant. Yeah. And do you know what popped into my head as you were saying that is in some comedies that I like as well, where you have an anti-hero, uh, The Office example with David Brent and Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David. Both those characters work, I think, because quite often they're sort of right. Yes, There's bits exactly. of what they do, particularly Larry David, where you think he's gone about it in a really cat-candid way and he's saying things cringeworthy, but he's right you know, yep, about what yep. he's doing. And that's probably the same sort of thing that's going on here with the villain. There's part of you thinking, well, humans kind is a bacteria on the planet and yep. one way of looking at it. I'm not sure I'd necessarily wipe it out as a result of that, but you know, <laughs> yeah. that's just the choice he's <laughs> making. And we, we need to respect each other's choices. So yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. Good. So tell me about the books themselves. How are they structured and how should people use them? Is this something you sit down and read through or do you make notes or do you, are there exercises? Um, so I have a textbook and a workbook. The workbook has summaries of each chapter and then uh, questions and exercises and uh, space for most of them. Some of them requ require kind of, you know, paragraphs of exercises, but uh, that's the workbooks. And then in the textbooks, um, I have written them so that you can pick and choose. So you can use them like a reference and just, you know, say you wanted to learn about creating fear. Um, you could just go to the fear chapter. If you wanted to learn about motivation, you could go to the motivation. Chapter. Um, but most people tend to read them front to back and I've kind of structured them. So they're ground up. So you start with the basics, personality traits, go to history, motivations, like gesturing, <laughs> yeah, um, up yeah, <laughs> up and up and up until you get to the pinnacle of a villain. Uh, yeah, so uh, and it's the same for the hero. I've kind of structured them from the ground up. And these work across genres, presumably heroes and villains in every. Um, yes, I do make a point of saying, um, you know, I'm not a literary writer. I'm not a horror writer. Don't go to my villains book expecting to write amazing horror. This, this is looking at characterization um, and how you can create a better character. And characters are in all genres. So um, yes, they are across genre. Um, and I also have examples from TV, film, um, possibly theatre, I can't quite remember. Um, so I've tried to make them as broad brush view as possible. Brilliant. Now, I think you're going to, you've got a giveaway for us. Yeah, I've got a um, kind of a, a quick cheat sheet guide to, I say quick, it's probably about 15, 17 pages, something like that. But it's a, a kind of mini summary um, of the book. So it will help you do the basics for creating your villain. So this is about creating a villain, a, a, yeah. a, a I say a shortcut, but 17 pages is a substantial <laughs> shortcut, but a substantial yeah. um, uh, I think there might work. be questions and kind of, yeah. to, you know, so yeah, that, that it's not all dense text. There are sort of helpful questions and, and things to make you think. If people want to go on and purchase the books, where can they find um, them? All good bookstores. Uh, I am wide, so, and I have paperbacks and ebooks and all of that malarkey. So um, Amazon, Kobo, Apple, all of those wonderful places. You can visit me on www.sashablack.co.uk. That's um, Sasha with a C in the middle, not an S. And I'm on Twitter, Instagram, I think Sasha Black author and all sort of Sasha Black uh, on all of the Facebooks and social medias. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Well, Sasha, it's always a pleasure talking to you. And I can't wait uh, for London Book Fair to share a couple of beers with you as I hand over my book 
to you absolutely i i tell you what it will be the best handshake i've ever given you and i i will chuck four pints your way if i need to if that's the encouragement you need to finish it i'll need them i'll need them i talked to you about my book earlier i'm going to do an update on the podcast the week after we're recording this but be it'd be long gone by the time this this broadcast brilliant such fun and good luck with your career sasha we're looking forward Thank to you, you making that final transition at running down those hours at the uh, local council i think you work at I do, yes. Local government for my sins. Give them the boot and it'll be the all new <laughs> Sasha Black, the complex, multi layered villain stroke anti hero. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute honour. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There we go, Mark. So you have a few baddies in your book, don't you, old uh, Milton? I mean, although Milton himself is a flawed character, but he comes across on the baddies. Do you put as much thought as you think you should into making sure the baddies are not just one-dimensional? Um, yeah, I try to. I think um, uh, as a couple, uh, I actually asked my Facebook um, group a while ago for favourite characters, and one of the bad guys came up more than once, which I wasn't that surprised about because there's one in particular an ex Mossad agent who Milton has um, has crossed Milton's path a few times, and and he's is harder than Milton is. So he's um, there's a few they have a couple of scraps, and Milton basically gets his backside handed to him by this guy, um, and he he was very popular um, because he he you know he has a there's a reason why he behaves the way he does towards Milton from something that Milton did um, in in his backstory. So. Yeah, actually, I, I love a I love a good villain. I mean, uh, you can look at the Bond films, and the ones that stick in your mind are the ones where the vi- the villains are interesting. So you know, the the new film Shatterhand, I think they're going to call it uh, with Remy Malek is is going to be the bad guy apparently, and I think he's a he's a great actor, and and not you know not a physically imposing Dave Batista type bad guy, but you know someone who could beat Bond because he's he's smart and intelligent and cunning um so yeah it's 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 an important area i was just thinking about the bond films as well as a good example of when baddies are done well it becomes the main feature of the film and um, in it even in the joke jokey austin powers films they create dr evil became a more layered character as you went through with his son and his complex relationship and even in that kind of throwaway jokey environment you layer in the character you don't simply present this person as evil for the sake of it yeah Um, yeah Good. Great. Well, that was a great episode. And just a reminder, you can get that fantastic uh, PDF uh, uh, guide on creating the perfect villain uh, from Sasha if you go to self-publishing show forward slash villains. Right. Very good. So let's just round up for the sake of completeness. We've offended the old. um, Yes, the Germans. The Germans. Um, If you're old and German, I'm sorry, I I can only apologize (laughs) <laughs> now we don't mean any of this this is all light-hearted playful fun um, it we, is we... And, and, and one of my excuses i put which i think probably uh, people will will understand and support is that we don't want to get into a position of scripting this and going through editorial you know it's well, going to be, be no podcast I there would be no <laughs> podcast no way we could do that so you have to forgive us from time to time when we say things that perhaps we would have said differently had we uh, sat there and thought about it for five minutes before we opened our mouth oh uh, yes i was about to say something um which is completely pointless and I was, I was going to mention the london book fair but that will have happened by the time this podcast goes out so um we will we will return um next week and we're actually going to do some recording at the london book fair so we can um yeah, so we're hoping, we're hoping at this stage that the next couple of episodes will be from the London Book Fair because this will go out on the Friday when we come back. But we'll um, we'll see about that, see how we get on with people. Um, so people hopefully will have come along to the drinks at, in London. And um, we're going to James be... offended you with the drinks, then I apologise yeah, from, from, from the past. First of all, I won't <laughs> talk to the old people, obviously. Um, <laughs> and then we're going to be in New York in July. We'll have some drinks there and we're going to be in... Uh, Florida and Vegas at the end of the year so there will be a chances to say hello to us and I know people post in from New Zealand and Australia every time and they say when are we coming um, but at some point we will make it down under um, and uh, we'll you can def- offend them as well I can offend them I think I have offended the Australians at some well, you point. normally do a very bad accent which I find offensive to my ears now come on mate <laughs> there we go I was waiting for that I was waiting I, I, I chipped it up and you you uh, for you to head it into the back of the net, but you ballooned it over the bar back up as the usual. <laughs> like a Manchester United 
they all got in penalty in the last minute. Right, that's it, I think, from us. It's been a mammoth episode. Thank you very much indeed to Sasha and congratulations again on transitioning from a nine-to-five job, which I think you did explain to me once was not the most exciting job in the world, to getting up in working in your pyjamas, uh, being a writer. How brilliant is that? We can celebrate Sasha's success uh, today very proudly as part of the SPF community. And if you've got a similar story, let us know because we love these moments. They're big moments in people's lives when we celebrate them. That was a nice note to end on, wasn't it? Almost made up for the damage you did earlier. Yes. Yeah, so um, it's uh, on that bombshell in a part- Patrician way. Um, I will say it's goodbye from me. And it's good night from him. Goodbye. Bye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.